This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. After a failed 1993 attempt to climb K2, Mortensen arrived in Corfe, emaciated and exhausted. In this impoverished community of mud and stone huts, both Mortensen's life and the lives of northern Pakistan's children changed course. One evening he went to bed by a yak dung fire, a mountaineer who'd lost his way. And one morning, by the time he'd shared a pot of butter tea with his hosts and laced up his boots, he'd become a humanitarian who'd found a meaningful path to follow for the rest of his life. Arriving in Corfe with Dr. Greg, Bangu and I were welcomed with open arms, the head of a freshly killed ibex, and endless cups of tea. And as we listened to the Shia children of Corfe, one of the world's most impoverished communities, talk about how their hopes and dreams for the future had grown exponentially since a big American arrived a decade ago to build them the first school their village had ever known, the general and I were done for. You know, Bangu said, as we were enveloped in a scrum of 120 students tugging us by the hands on a tour of their school, flying with President Musharraf, I've become acquainted with many world leaders, many outstanding gentlemen and ladies, but I think Greg Mortensen is the most remarkable person I've ever met. Everyone who has had the privilege of watching Greg Mortensen operate in Pakistan is amazed by how encyclopedically well he has come to know one of the world's most remote regions. And many of them find themselves, almost against their will, pulled into his orbit. During the last decade, since a series of failures and accidents transformed him from a mountaineer to a humanitarian, Mortensen has attracted what has to be one of the most underqualified and overachieving staffs of any charitable organization on earth. Illiterate high-altitude porters in Pakistan's Karakoram have put down their packs to make paltry wages with him so their children can have the education they were forced to do without. A taxi driver who chanced to pick Mortensen up at the Islamabad airport sold his cab and became his fiercely dedicated fixer. Former Taliban fighters renounced violence and the oppression of women after meeting Mortensen and went to work with him peacefully building schools for girls. He has drawn volunteers and admirers from every stratum of Pakistan's society and from all the warring sects of Islam. Supposedly objective journalists are at risk of being drawn into his orbit, too. On three occasions, I accompanied Mortensen to northern Pakistan, flying to the most remote valleys of the Karakoram Himalaya and the Hindu Kush on helicopters that should have been hanging from the rafters of museums. The more time I spent watching Mortensen work, the more convinced I became that I was in the presence of someone extraordinary. The accounts I'd heard about Mortensen's adventures building schools for girls in the remote mountain regions of Pakistan sounded too dramatic to believe before I left home. The story I found, with ibex hunters in the high valleys of the Karakoram, in nomad settlements at the wild edge of Afghanistan, around conference tables with Pakistan's military elite, and over endless cups of Paiyu cha in tea rooms so smoky I had to squint to see my notebook, was even more remarkable than I'd imagined. As a journalist who has practiced this odd profession of probing into people's lives for two decades, I've met more than my share of public figures who didn't measure up to their own press. But at Corfe and every other Pakistani village where I was welcomed like long-lost family because another American had taken the time to forge ties there, I saw the story of the last ten years of Greg Mortensen's existence branch and fork with a richness and complexity far beyond what most of us achieve over the course of a full-length life. This is a fancy way of saying that this is a story I couldn't simply observe. Anyone who travels to the CAI's 53 schools with Mortensen is put to work, and in the process becomes an advocate. And after staying up at all-night jirgas with village elders and weighing in on proposals for new projects, or showing a classroom full of excited eight-year-old girls how to use the first pencil sharpener anyone has ever cared to give them, or teaching an impromptu class on English slang to a room full of gravely respectful students, it is impossible to remain simply a reporter. As Graham Greene's melancholy correspondent Thomas Fowler learned by the end of The Quiet American, 
Sometimes, to be human, you have to take sides. I choose to side with Greg Mortensen, not because he doesn't have his flaws. His fluid sense of time made pinning down the exact sequence of many events in this book almost impossible, as did interviewing the Balti people with whom he works, who have no tenses in their language and as little attachment to linear time as the man they call Dr. Greg. During the two years we worked together on this book, Mortensen was often so maddeningly late for appointments that I considered abandoning the project. Many people, particularly in America, have turned on Mortensen after similar experiences, calling him unreliable or worse. But I have come to realize, as his wife Tara Bishop often says, Greg is not one of us. He operates on Mortensen time, a product perhaps of growing up in Africa and working much of each year in Pakistan. And his method of operation, hiring people with limited experience based on gut feelings, forging working alliances with necessarily unsavory characters, and, above all, winging it, while unsettling and unconventional, has moved mountains. For a man who has achieved so much, Mortensen has a remarkable lack of ego. After I agreed to write this book, he handed me a page of notepaper with dozens of names and numbers printed densely down the margin in tiny script. It was a list of his enemies. Talk to them all, he said. Let them have their say. We've got the results, that's all I care about. I listened to hundreds of Mortensen's allies and enemies, and in the interest of security and or privacy, I've changed a very few names and locations. Working on this book was a true collaboration. I wrote the story, but Greg Mortensen lived it. And together, as we sorted through thousands of slides, reviewed a decade's worth of documents and videos, recorded hundreds of hours of interviews, and traveled to visit with the people who are central to this unlikeliest of narratives, we brought this book to life. And as I found in Pakistan, Mortensen's Central Asia Institute does, irrefutably, have the results. In a part of the world where Americans are at best misunderstood and more often feared and loathed, this soft-spoken six-foot-four former mountaineer from Montana has put together a string of improbable successes. Though he would never say so himself, he has single-handedly changed the lives of tens of thousands of children and independently won more hearts and minds than all the official American propaganda flooding the region. So this is a confession. Rather than simply reporting on his progress, I want to see Greg Mortensen succeed. I wish him success because he is fighting the war on terror the way I think it should be conducted. Slamming over the so-called Karakoram Highway in his old land cruiser, taking great personal risks to cede the region that gave birth to the Taliban with schools, Mortensen goes to war with the root causes of terror every time he offers a student a chance to receive a balanced education, rather than attend an extremist madrasa. If we Americans are to learn from our mistakes, from the flailing, ineffective way we as a nation conducted the war on terror after the attacks of 9-11, and from the way we have failed to make our case to the great moderate mass of peace-loving people at the heart of the Muslim world, we need to listen to Greg Mortensen. I did, and it has been one of the most rewarding experiences of my life. David Oliver Rellin, Portland, Oregon Chapter 1. Failure. When it is dark enough, you can see the stars. Persian Proverb. In Pakistan's Karakoram, bristling across an area barely 100 miles wide, more than 60 of the world's tallest mountains lord their severe alpine beauty over a witnessless high-altitude wilderness. Other than snow leopard and ibex, so few living creatures have passed through this barren ice scape that the presence of the world's second highest mountain, K2, was little more than a rumor to the outside world until the turn of the 20th century. 
flowing down from K2 toward the populated upper reaches of the Indus Valley, between the four fluted granite spires of the Gosher Brooms and the lethal-looking daggers of the Great Trango Towers, the 62-kilometer-long Balturo Glacier barely disturbs this still cathedral of rock and ice. And even the motion of this frozen river, which drifts at a rate of four inches a day, is almost undetectable.